the Whopper. Yeah, you want a chocolate? Oh, what happened to the old one? Well, we had a break-in. And they took two things. Our laptop and the treasure chest. <laughs> Laptop's not funny. <laughs> and that's not funny either. <laughs> My H Hannah was devastated. <laughs> We'd had that for years. <coughs> it was part of the morning past the Hilton was one of the uh, institutions of the church, the treasure chest. <laughs> anyway, we've got a new one, so it does exist. I've, I've spoken about it. Now you can see that it is real. All right. Speaking of... All right, let's uh, make a start. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you all. Halls are away today. Up in Taree, back to Taree to reacquaint and uh, minister up there. So they'll be coming back Tuesday, I think. Something like that. Anyway, so they're away. Um, their pastor, of course, is unwell. So we'll see. We may see him a bit later in the morning. And uh, Pastor Skelton, good to see you. And uh, Pastor Skelton's preaching this morning. So. Look forward to that. All right, let's uh, pray and then we'll go over our memory verse. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for our time together again. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you'd speak to us and teach us through uh, the scriptures. May we have a well-rounded understanding and a mature understanding of the word of God. May it uh, affect how we approach things, how we live. And I uh, pray you be with the pastor and I pray especially for the halls as they travel back. Keep them safe on the roads. And uh, we do thank you for our church in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, it's Titus chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And um, there are a few chocolates in there. It's not as full as I thought it was, but anyway, see how we go. All right, let's say it together. And then anyone who wants to have a go can be tested. Let's say it, Titus chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Titus chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Now, in past, we have a seven-year cycle, of course, so past cycles, we've only done verse 5. We extended it to verse 6 just to give you a bit of a challenge. I think we'll give you the chocolate if you can do 5, though. I think that's, that's fair. So, Who'd like to have a go? Go yeah, on, James. Word perfect. Very good, James. Anyone else? No, only one brave soul. James, I'm not sure I can carry this. We'll see how we go. Oh, it's not too heavy. <laughs> Bring it up to you. <laughs> this is the last time I'm doing this. <laughs> As I said, I had been talking. Oh, fix that later. Had been talking about it. Just wanted you to see it is real. We do have one. Okay. Anyone else wants to have a go at that? Uh, just catch me later or Pastor Hall next week. We allow to allow you to do it next week if you'd like to. Um, <coughs> don't want to. If you're not quite there this week, we don't want to discourage you. So, if you'd like to do it next week, that's absolutely fine. All right, let's have a look at our study today, Qualifications of Pastors and Deacons. Now, you might think I did this on purpose, do this one while the pastors are away. <laughs> we can pick on them. No, it's all recorded, so I've got to be careful. Um, no, no, it's just where we are in the, in the study. Um, and mainly on the pastors, because the deacons double up a fair bit. So. But uh, we'll have a look at what exactly 
the Lord has put forward for that office. Let's, uh, actually, I'll look at the introductory comments, then we'll do a bit of reading. Uh, now, Bible-believing Baptists and others only recognise two offices in the church, the pastor and the deacon, and uh, other groups have a list of other roles. Uh, Protestants normally just have a minister and deacons and maybe others. Um, minister is just a general term to show that that man has an official ministry in the church, an ordained ministry. Uh, elder and bishop, Presbyterians have elders and other groups as well. Presbyterian comes from the Greek word presbyteros, means elder. Presbyterians, rule of the elders, that's their focus. Uh, and bishops, okay, so Anglicans and Catholics and others. Um, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Let's just turn there. I'll, I'll show you this, and, and that'll put this to bed forever, that uh, pastor, elder, and bishop are actually the same thing. And I'll tell you why. Pastor means to shepherd. Elder means a mature Christian man. And bishop means to rule or overseer. Okay, so it's to do with the administration, the running of the thing. So let's have a look at... Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. The elders, so we've got one of them, which are among you, I exhort, whom am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So Paul says, talking to your elders is what you need to do. Feed the flock of God. Now that's what a shepherd does, right? Feeds the flock. So there's your pastor, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight. Well, that's what bishop means, overseer. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Uh, in verse 3, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples or examples to the flock. And it talks about the chief shepherd, which is Christ. So, pastor, bishop, Elder. It's the same role, it's just the three aspects of that role. Okay? Pastor and deacon, two roles in a Bible believing Baptist church and, and plenty of other churches too. <coughs> now, there's no academic qualifications for the role of pastor or deacon. Pastor Skelton just says, Why did I spend all those years studying then? Uh, well, a Bible college education is very helpful to become a pastor, but it's not mandatory. There are, we know of pastors who never went to Bible college, and they're good pastors. Um, maybe they struggle with some things. Maybe they have to work a bit harder on some things because they didn't do the, the study at college. But um, it's not mandatory, but it's certainly helpful. The qualifications for pastors and deacons can be divided into spiritual gifts and graces. So there's the gifts that God gives and there's graces that need to be there. Pastors need to have both. They need to have both the gifts and the graces. Deacons require only the graces because they don't have to have a preaching or teaching ministry. You can have deacons in a church who never get out the front. That's, that's fine. Okay, so deacons only have to have the graces. If a man has the gifts without the graces, he cannot be a pastor or a deacon. So if he's able to preach and teach, but he doesn't fulfill the other qualifications, he can't be a pastor or a deacon. Uh, the scriptures disqualify that man from the offices of the local church. doesn't mean he doesn't, can't serve, can't be fruitful, but there's problems there and he's not able to fill those roles. Uh, as for the possibility of female pastors and deacons, well, we've already been through 1 Timothy chapter 2, haven't we? Uh, women are to learn in silence with all subjection and not usurp the authority over the man. So that would rule out women as being pastors or deacons. Now, the Roman Catholic Church is quite interesting. Uh, they've, over the years, well maybe not the Roman Catholic Church officially, but the churches that became the Roman Catholic Church, so the churches of about 200, 300, 400 AD. The Roman Catholic Church didn't form fully to about 500 AD. 
Uh, they had deaconesses, some of them anyway. And from that, they ended up with nuns. So you see where the Roman Catholic nun comes from. But now the Roman Catholic Church says they don't do female deacons, which is, you still have nuns, so how that work? <laughs> yeah, but um, we don't worry too much about what they do. But if you're just wondering where nuns came from and uh, female deacons, well, hmm, interesting history. It's not biblical, though. Uh, the deaconesses in the liberal churches and the female pastors are also not biblical. Uh, the NIV, interestingly enough, in a verse we're about to look at, has the women, not the wives of the deacons, but the women. And uh, some people try to squeeze through that gap and say that we can have female deacons. Uh, but the verse is clear about, clearly about the wives of deacons. We'll get there in a minute. Deacons are male, and I've made a little comment there. Feminism is death in the pot. Feminism promises so much to women, but it actually takes so much away from them. Uh, you will not gain with feminism. It's, it's an anti-biblical idea, and our Bible helps us to avoid its poison. Uh, feminism poisons things. I'm not saying women shouldn't get paid the same as men and all that sort of thing. If they're doing the same job, they should get the same amount of money. That's a biblical principle, isn't it? But uh, the idea that uh, we start tearing up the biblical structures of family and church in favour of a, an ideology is not good. We will stay away from that. All right, let's have a look at uh, the first seven verses of chapter 3. Qualifications of a pastor. Now listen, <clears throat> don't be too hard on your pastors. Maybe put yourself under the same scrutiny first, okay? Uh, don't, don't pick too much. But let's have a look at what does the Bible say are the qualifications of a pastor. James, can you read verse 1 and we'll continue through to verse 7, please? Yes, please. Hang on, yeah. I, think, I think you're in verse, we're in, uh, yeah. Two Timothys, always tricky. <laughs> We've all done that. Yeah, 1 Timothy 3 verse 2, yep. Okay, so that's the biblical list of qualifications of a pastor. So it's good for a man to desire the office of a bishop or a pastor. That's a good thing to want to do, isn't it? Serve the Lord as a pastor. It's good to want to pastor and do good works in the church. But that noble desire is not enough. A man must be suited to the role. We talk about being called. And the first requirement is that he is to be blameless. Now, does that mean he never sins? No. There must be no great stain of public sin and reproach associated with him which will discredit the local church. There mustn't be anything in the pastor's life that either people within the church or people outside can go, hang on, how can he be the pastor? Because of that, whatever that is. There must be no reproach brought on the church 
because he is to be blamed for something. Must be nothing which the gainsayers can latch onto and reasonably criticize the church. Now, if they're unreasonable, if they're attacking the pastor, making things up, or just being generally unreasonable, well, that's, that's not his fault. But if there's something that's reasonable, something that uh, you go, yeah, actually, I have a point. Uh, generally, we try to make sure those sort of men don't get into the pastorate in the first place. Um, so this would be a list that we'd put up against a man who's considering becoming a pastor. Uh, however, just remember, this requirement should not be pushed too far. Um, if any of you think that you're blameless, think again. Uh, and I'll give you an example. The Apostle Peter was to be blamed. It says that in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Uh, he was Judaizing. He was uh, trying to bring... Well, he got involved with those who were trying to bring Christians back under the law. And Paul says, I withstood him to his face, for he was to be blamed. He got it wrong publicly, badly. This is heresy. So, but Peter remained an apostle and a pastor. So let's, sure, he is to be blameless, but let's not push it too far, okay? If, if you notice that pastor did something and went, hmm, he shouldn't do that, well, okay, maybe tell him, but uh, let's not go too far with this. But uh, in general, the pastor should be blameless. We don't put someone into the pastorate who has a big problem and that creates uh, issues with the outside world and within the church itself. Secondly, a pastor must not have more than one wife. Who has more than one wife? <laughs> it does happen, not in Australia. Uh, Australia has been influenced by biblical principles. That's why polygamy and bigamy are illegal. If you go to get married, one of the questions they ask you is, are you married? And if you say, yeah, I'm married, well, you can't get married again. Okay? Pastor must be the husband of one wife. Does that mean he has to be married? No. But if he is married, he can't have two. Does this ever happen anywhere? Well, yes. In some parts of the world, men do have more than one wife. New Guinea is somewhere which has actually come up where there was a pastor I heard of who had two wives. He got married to both of them before he got saved and obviously they thought that he should have been put into the ministry for some reason but it became an issue and he had to resign the, the pastorate. He had two wives. So, not allowed. Think about it. A pastor with multiple wives would create chaos in the church. Imagine if there was trouble at home on a Sunday morning. <laughs> you came to church and both your wives are fighting and you're the pastor. Not good. Uh, now, as far as divorce and remarriage goes, uh, some people try to use the Greek with this and, and say various things and I can think of occasions where a man got married, got divorced, got saved, then he got remarried became a missionary or something. I do know, do know about these sort of examples. And people go, hang on, hang on, hang on. He's, he's had more than one wife. Well, we don't have that issue in our church, so we'll just figure out what happens with us. But uh, I think what you need to look at is, is the man blameless? Did he do something he should be blamed for or not? A man who has traded his wife in for a younger model is not blameless. That's wrong. The command is to rejoice with the wife of thy youth, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18, rather than treacherously abandoning her in pursuit of fleshly lusts. So I think you would have to look at the case on its merits, but... Um, Blameless, I think, is the, the principle that goes through all of this. Now, the next four qualifications of the pastor cover his conduct in the church. He is to be vigilant. Has pastor ever buttonholed you and said, I need to talk to you about something? It's not because he doesn't like you. It's because he's being vigilant. He's commanded to be vigilant. What verse was that? 
Yeah, I've lost it. Two, there it is. Husband of one wife. Vigilant. He is to chase off heresy, which would damage the church. He is to rebuke sin. That's what he's supposed to do. He is to pray against any issues which might hurt the assembly and its people. So don't be offended if uh, a pastor says, I need to have a word with you. Learn. See what he has to say. Think about it. Don't just get offended. That's what most people do these days. If they don't like what's being said to them, they get offended. Um, but think about it. He has a job to protect you. If, if he's doing that job, you should be thankful, even if you don't like what he's saying. Our pastor is to be sober. Now, <clears throat> this has obviously at least two meanings. One is about alcohol and the other is just about being serious. We talk about being sober-minded, serious people. He should be that. Uh, and he should avoid alcohol. Now listen, alcohol is a poison of body, mind and soul. You need to stay away from it and we certainly don't want any of our pastors uh, drinking alcohol. And people bring up, oh Jesus turned water into wine and that sort of thing. The Greek word for wine covers alcoholic and not alcoholic. Okay, Read the breadth of the scriptures, everything it says about alcohol, come to your own conclusion. I think it will be negative. If you're not convinced, get two 40-year-olds. One who's drunk alcohol since they're a teenager and one who's never touched the stuff. Have a look at them. It's a poison. Pastor's behaviour must be good, that is godly. And he must be a hospitable man who is generous to visitors. And this is why pastors often, if there's a visitor uh, from another church or a speaker or something, um, they will go out to lunch or something like that. So you'll, you'll notice that. Pastors are to be hospitable, friendly. Um, and as people come in, who do they shake hands with often? The pastor's there. How are you going? What's your name? Being hospitable. Now, verse 2, it's important that a pastor can preach and teach. That's part of his role as the shepherd who spiritually feeds the flock. And these are spiritual gifts from the Lord. And just because you can speak doesn't mean that you can preach. But just because you can teach in one way doesn't mean you can teach in the church. These are spiritual gifts. And vice versa. You may not be very good at uh, speaking outside, but maybe God will give you, and when you get saved, the gift of preaching. A man who does not have these gifts is not called to the pastoral ministry. You can't have a pastor who can't preach and teach. Now you might say, well, some are better than others. Okay, some are better than others. But uh, there must be something of that gift for a man to be a pastor. Now the next six qualifications examine the candidate's personal conduct. And I've already spoken about alcohol. So all the filth that comes with that are to be shunned. It's not to be a man who gets into brawls. Alcohol, violence and nudity are often very strongly connected, aren't they? Not to get into brawls. Not to chase dodgy deals for profit. You don't want a pastor who's always going on about his next shady deal and how he's going to make money out of it. Filthy lucre. Uh, while they're not specifically mentioned, bad language, bad attitude and immodesty are all the common companions of alcohol and a pastor should be clear of these. He should not be coveting the possessions of others. And he needs to be patient very patient. One of the uh, privileges of uh, being involved with this church for a while now and, and having a close association with Pastor Shelabair, one of the benefits about a small church is you have a close association with your pastor. Um, and we were much smaller for quite a while. So I've seen firsthand how patient pastor has been with uh, well, me and my family among others but uh, a lot of other people too and um, it's been a bit sad for him at times as people have sort of walked away because they couldn't get over something or they weren't able to 
get right and they got offended because the pastor kept saying, you need to sort this out, you need to sort this out. He was very patient and uh, this is certainly something that a pastor needs to be because if you're not, if a pastor's not very patient, one, he's not going to allow people the time they need to see things the right way and, and fix them and also he's going to get discouraged and he'll quit. So pastors need to be patient. It's uh, one of the qualifications. And he should be content with what God has given him. And uh, <coughs> Pastor Shelabar says, um, I'm blessed. I'm so blessed. God's blessed me so much. And um, came to Nara with certain assets and he says, God's blessed me. The last three qualifications of the pastor relate to the title of elder, so that mature Christian man. Uh, so this is what a candidate for the pastorate should be. He should be an experienced Christian with a good track record. Ruling a household is good preparation for overseeing a local church. There's always issues with kids, always. They've always got something that's coming up that you've got to deal with. Churches are the same. I'm not saying Christians are childish. They can be sometimes. <laughs> that does happen, but um, there's always issues. When, you, when you've got people in, in a group that's committed to uh, each other like that, there's always issues coming up. So he's got to know how to deal with that. And uh, having kids is good practice. So he needs to rule that household well. And uh, his conduct as a father should be considered. If um, he hasn't ruled well in his household, how's he going to go in the church? Now, the word novice is in verse 6. And that means someone that's new to something. A man who wants to be a pastor should not be a novice to the Christian walk or Christian ministry. That would be a disaster, wouldn't it? Get a new Christian in, make him the pastor. He's just going to make mistakes. Uh, even someone who's new to ministry, get a Christian in who's never done anything, and all of a sudden you make them the pastor. Again, they're going to make mistakes. They're not going to be any good. Someone who uh, we're considering as a pastor should be a veteran. They should have uh, some experience. A novice would make simple mistakes which would hurt the local church, and a novice could be lifted up with pride due to his premature promotion to a place of authority in the local church. That's, uh, what does it say there in verse 7? Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Well, what was it that uh, was Satan's downfall? It was Lucifer. Uh, he was the covering cherub until the day that pride was found in him. And so pride would be a, a real trap. The good pastor knows that he is there to serve, not to lord it over the believers. It's a balance. Pastors have authority, but they're also there to serve. The good pastor knows he may be attacked with abuse and slander from outside the church. This happens sometimes more than others, but this happens. Uh, but we should expect it. And there must be nothing legitimate in what these people say. So it should just be slander and abuse, not truth. If they're having a go at us, it shouldn't be true. <laughs> if it's true, <coughs> we've got a problem. Uh, the pastor who is faithful to his calling. Let's just turn there again. First uh, Peter chapter 5 again. Is it five crowns at the judgment seat of Christ? I should have looked it up. I think it's five. You don't remember, do you? Seven, seven is it? I think so. Okay. You could be correct. I, um, I didn't look that one up. But here's one of them anyway. Uh, so this is just for pastors. Verse 4. And when the chief shepherd, that's Christ, shall appear... He shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So this is directed to pastors. Pastors who do well, there's a special reward for them. 
for their service, the crown of glory. There's other crowns. There's a, a soul winner's crown. And I'll stop there before I show that I didn't look it up. But um, we can give you the list. Might be another lesson we could do sometime. All right, let's read again. Deacons. I made this really short. No, the main reason it's short is there's a lot of double up with the pastors. You might think it's just because I'm a deacon and I don't want the scrutiny, but that's probably true too. No, there's double up. All right, let's have a look at uh, verse 8. Who are we up to? Yeah, you can read. Sorry. Now you're right. Mm-hmm. And let and let these also be also first be proved, then let them who do the office of the deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be brave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Not that the fools together. Find them so for the way. Women be our children and brethren wives as well. But they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great honor to the said duty in Christ Jesus. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife. Amen. That's a good idea. All right. Deacons should be mature Christian men held to the same behavior standards as pastor, pastors. So everything that was the graces, the behavior standards for the pastors applies to the deacons. With one important addition, deacons and their wives should be personally loyal to the pastor. Okay, we need deacons and their wives should back the pastor or the pastors. They are not to be double tongued. That's why that that's in there. Not double tongued. Verse eight. Backstabbers, basically, or slanderous. Now, what I've seen in some churches, not in the independent Baptist circles, although maybe it does occur, but uh, in Baptist Union churches years ago, they used to move the pastor on, the minister on, every couple of years. Didn't have a lot of, most ministers didn't stay in a church for a long period of time. I'm sure some of them did, but there was a bit of a habit of moving the guy on after two years, three years, four years. And what that did was it made the deacons the power centers of those churches because they were there for long periods of time. A man would be a deacon for 10, 20, 30 years. Now, if you've been a deacon in a church for 20 years and some young fellow comes in from Bible college as the pastor and you know he's only going to be there two years, the power kind of goes the wrong way, doesn't it? You have the deacon telling the pastor what to do rather than being the servant. That's what deacon means, servant. So deacons need to be careful. They should not be double-tongued. They should not be slanderous. And a pastor should enjoy their full support. The local church must not be divided. There shouldn't be factions. A deacon who cannot provide this sort of support should resign. That was that's what you do in good conscience, isn't it? If you can't fulfill the role that you're in, you resign that role. Uh, now I'm not saying pastors should be, you know, dictators or anything. Um, they they also are servants, but deacons just need to be careful that uh, they're not opposing or providing some other sort of uh, centre of I don't know, popularity or something. Deacons do not need to be able to teach or preach. Don't have to. There can be deacons that, as I said, never come out the front. Maybe they come out the front and pray or something, but um, never out here teaching or preaching. Although if they have these gifts, they should exercise them. Now, I much prefer just to sit there and listen to the pastors. That's that's much more preferable for me. Um, I enjoy that, and I tell Pastor Shell about that. But um, if there's a need, as, as there is at the moment, I'll, I'll definitely step up. 
so, yeah, if they have those gifts, they should be exercised. And there's a promise there for deacons, verse 13. Deacon who does his job well will enjoy great enabling from the Lord as he witnesses. As I say, they purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, we see that in the book of Acts. You can have a look at Acts chapter 6 and 7. All right, last couple of verses, verses 14 and 15. We're not going to do verse 16. I'm going to do a whole lesson on verse 16. That's a very, very important verse. So we'll look at that next week. But verses 14 and 15. Who was I up to? Perhaps a skeleton? Yeah. He's been dobbed in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. All right. How to behave in church. Well, verse 14 indicates that the Apostle Paul was either not in jail or he was about to be released. And as I said when we began this uh, series on 1 Timothy, we're not quite sure when this was written and what the context was. It may have been written in between two imprisonments of Paul or before he was in prison. It, it's not clear. But um, we see from verse 14 that he was hoping, as I say, hoping to come under these shortly. Uh, he wanted to go to Ephesus and he sets out the clear behaviour expectations for both the office holders, the pastors and the deacons, and the members of that local church. Now it's interesting. Australians used to know how to behave in public. Australians used to know that uh, when someone's talking in a public context, you'll be quiet. And I guess they learned that in school as well, but one place where that was... Uh, of conditioned into people was church. People went to church and they knew that when there's someone out the front talking, you be quiet and you listen respectfully. The secularization of our society has seen a deterioration of this type of decorum. People don't do this all the time anymore. And some of it's ignorance. They just don't know. They haven't been trained. So if we get people who come in here, new people, um, they may not comprehend these things. So a quiet word of encouragement and just the general example of everybody else, well, over time they'll kind of, they'll get it, they'll understand it and uh, they'll be right. That will go a long way towards helping them to understand what is God honouring behaviour. Now verse 15 gives the two reasons why decorum is necessary in the local church. Firstly, the congregation is the habitation of God. The congregation is the habitation of God, not the building. We try to be respectful with our building because this is a building set aside for uh, ministry and for the worship of the Lord, but the building is not technically the church. We call it the church, but the building is not technically the church. The people are the church. And so Christ within the believer, and we're all meeting together, is the habitation of God. The scriptures clearly show that respect and reverence are required. And the second reason is, this is where the word of God is preached. And that makes the meetings of the local church the pillar and ground of truth. Where else in society do you get biblical truth preached? It's here. This is where it occurs. This is the pillar and ground of truth. So there should be no distractions as people listen to biblical truth. So we just need to... Look, our church is, is quite good and um, always has been. But we just need to keep an eye on that and make sure that we're just doing what we should, behaving the way we should uh, when we meet together for our church services and uh, make sure that we're being respectful and reverencing the Lord and also allowing people to hear the word of God as it is preached. So maybe that wasn't happening in Ephesus. I'm sure it wasn't happening in Corinth at one point, the party church. But um, 
just need to make sure that's us as well. By the way, Ephesus, they obviously listened because they became doctrinally and in most other ways sort of the model church uh, a couple of decades after this. John spoke about them. They'd lost their first love, which was a shame, but in every other way, they were the model church. So these things that Paul told Timothy and Timothy taught to them, obviously they listened because uh, they turned out really well. All right, let's... Uh, Close in prayer and let's have a cuppa. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our pastors and, uh, and the role of the deacon. And Lord, I pray that uh, you'll bless our church and bless our pastors. Um, Lord, we pray for our service that uh, we, we would see things uh, quiet and, and focused on the preaching of the word of God. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen.